Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in. Steven here with Team Euphoric and this is day six of the 80 days to your dream body course. Today's protein source is going to be duck breast with the skin and today is a back training session. The theme for today's video is posture. So today I'm gonna to be teaching you how to perform a full postural assessment. Now let's get started. And while we're resting, it is time to move on to the theme of today's video, which is posture. And right now I'm going to be demonstrating how to perform a full postural assessment. I had mentioned this a while back, but back in 2018, I was hired by the American gym chain Crunch Fitness to train their trainers. And I developed this entire course. And in that course, the very first thing that I got them to do was do a postural assessment. And I created this worksheet right over here and I gave it to them. So every single gym member that signed up, this is what they went through. And I'm just gonna show you right now so you have an idea of what exactly it is. If you would like this, you can join my Carnivore Coaching Community Facebook group and you can download it as a free resource. It is called Initial Physical Assessment. You can find it in the Files tab. But with regard to the Initial Physical Assessment, whenever I am performing a postural assessment, I like to do it on my custom grid wall. If you do not have a grid wall, the three pieces of equipment that you need, and they are all very, very cheap. One is a business card, two is a piece of string, and three is a key. If you don't have a posture wall, you're going to do a static postural assessment with a, with a plumb line. The plumb line is going to act as your vertical re reference point for when you are performing a postural assessment and dangling the key at the bottom, that is going to ensure that it remains vertical. With regard to the postural assessment, it's going to be performed in three different phases, four phases. You're gonna do one from the front, one from each side, and then one from the back. You're going to start with the front. And when you perform the postural assessment from the front, if you are using a plumb line, you want to make sure that the plumb line is behind the patient. That's very important. The reason you want the plumb line behind the patient is because if it is in front of them, they'll be able to self-correct and adjust accordingly. If it's behind them, they're not going to be able to see it. And then another thing worth noting when you are performing a postural assessment is it would be beneficial to talk to your client or patient for a couple of minutes and just have them stand there because what's going to happen is if they know that their posture is being assessed, they're going to try and get into perfect posture. But if you start to have a conversation with them, all of their natural faults are going to start to show. After about a couple minutes talking to them, then you could start the initial assessment. But the first thing that we're going to do is we are going to assess from the front and everything is going to start from the ground and we are going to work our way up. But we're almost out of time. We've got about 15 seconds left before set number two. So we're just going to take a quick break to do that set. And then when you return, we're going to start at the ankle. And continuing with the postural assessment, I'm going to be using my good old friend, Johnny Bones, who you haven't seen in a while. If you would prefer to see me do this on a real life patient, I have a bunch of videos on assessment, assessing posture. You could go to my assessment series playlist and they will all be found right there. But for today, I'm gonna to be using Johnny as my guinea pig. And all of these, you would want to perform them standing in front of the patient when you are performing it from the front. For some of the points, I'm gonna be standing off to the side just so you can see what I'm doing. But starting at the ground up, the first thing that we wanna do is take a look at the foot. We're taking a look at a couple things. One, we want to take a look at are the toes pointing straight ahead or are they rotated outward? If the toes are pointing straight ahead, then that is an ideal position. If they are rotated outward, that can indicate a couple of things. One, it could indicate some tightness in the lateral rotators of the hip, or it could it indicate some tibial torsion going on. The way that you would differentiate between those two is later on, what you would do is have the patient sit down in a chair, and then when they're sitting, if, they're, if their feet are pointing straight ahead, you know that the restriction is coming from the hip. However, if when they are seated, their tibia is still rotated outward, then that could indicate tibial torsion. And ideally, it should not be ro rotated more than 20 degrees outward. If it's rotated more than 20 degrees, then that would indicate tibial torsion. The next thing that we would wanna do at the foot is take a look at supination versus pronation. With regard to supination and pronation, you could take your index finger and put it underneath the medial arch of the foot. If there is a gigantic gap, that could indicate excessive supination. And if you can't get your finger under there, that could indicate pronation. However, that's not ideal because depending on your size and the size of the patient, that could skew the results. If you are a very large therapist performing this assessment on a very tiny patient, then you may think that they have excessive pronation when in fact your finger's just too big. So what you would want to do instead is use a business card. With regard to the business card, you would want to line it up to the lateral malleolus of the ankle. And ideally, the lateral arch of the foot and the lateral malleolus of the ankle should be in one straight line. 
If the lateral malleolus of the ankle has a gap between the lateral arch of the foot, then that would indicate excessive pronation. And if there is a gap between the lateral arch of the foot and the business card, that would indicate excessive supination. We've got about 10 seconds left. And when you get back, we are going to work our way up to the knee. And while we're resting, we are going to continue the postural assessment by moving up to the knees. With regard to the knees, you want to be standing in front. And the first thing you want to do is take a look at and see, are the knees in a neutral position? Ideally, everything should be pointing straight down. You want to take a look and see, are they knock knees, meaning are the knees caving in or are they bow legged? And is it shaped outward like a bow? Once you've taken a look at that, the next thing that you would want to do is a little bit of palpation. So for the palpation, you would take a look at the tibial, tibial tuberosity. The tibial tuberosity, you have the patella, the patellar tendon, and then just below that is the tibial tuberosity. So you would palpate both sides. And what you want to do is see, is it balanced? Is one higher than the other or are they even? Ideally, it should be even. If one is elevated or depressed, then that could indicate some type of pathology going on in the knee. The next thing that you would do is just palpate the actual tendon itself and just get a feel for it. See, is there any difference between right and left? From there, you would take a look at the patella and same thing. You're just assessing the height of the different patellas and seeing are they in line or is one higher than the other? Once we've assessed the knee, we are going to move up to the hip. With regard to the hip, we're gonna do a couple of things. One, we're gonna take a look at the foot once again and see, are they pointing straight ahead or is it externally rotated? If the feet are pointed out, make note of that because that could indicate some hip and some hip tightness of the lateral rotators of the hip. You would also want to palpate the greater trochanter of the femur. The greater trochanter of the femur is this bone right over here. So what you would do is just stand right in front. You would palpate on each side and then you would want to see is one side higher than the other. And right now, if you look at my fingers, you can see that Johnny has a little bit of elevation going on on his right femur. So he either has some tightness in the superficial fibers of the glutes or he has a lot of weakness in the superficial fibers on the left glutes. But that's what you would take a look at. Once we've assessed the, the hip, we are going to move up to the pelvis and we're going to do the same thing. We are going to palpate at the ASIS or the anterior superior iliac spine. That is these bones right over here. And you would do the exact same thing. So you would just palpate that and see, are they level or is one higher than the other? And that is it for right now. We've got about 10 seconds left. Once we get back from the fourth set, we are going to move up to the rib cage. But right now, time for set number four. And while we are resting, we're gonna continue the postural assessment at the hip, at the pelvis. Aside from just taking a look at the anterior superior iliac spine and seeing are they level, we also wanna take a look and see is there any rotation involved at the, at the pelvis. Ideally, it should be pointing straight ahead. You wanna see is it rotated clockwise, counterclockwise. Once you've assessed the pelvis, we are going to move up to the rib cage. For the rib cage, what you would do is you would want to palpate at the bottom of the rib cage. So for this, what we would do is just go ahead and at the lateral aspect of the rib cage, you are going to place your fingers right at the bones and you wanna see, is it level or is one elevated? Aside from it, being ele uh, from it being level, a couple other things that you wanna take a look at, same with the pelvis, is there any rotation going on? So is it rotating clockwise, counterclockwise? And you wanna also want to see if there's any type of shifting. Ideally, from the nose all the way down, the center of the nose, the center of the chin, the sternum, the, the center of the pelvis, it should be all in alignment. If the rib cage, you notice that it is laterally, that it is moving laterally from the plumb line, then that's gonna indicate some type of pathology. So you would just wanna make note of that. Then once we've assessed the rib cage, what we would want to do is move up to the shoulder joint. At the shoulder, what we're gonna do is place our fingertips and we're going to palpate at the acromion. The acromion is right over here. And what you would do is just stand right in front you would place one finger on each acromion and you just want to see is one elevated or is one depressed if one is elevated again there's an asymmetry going on and you would want to address that with some type of corrective exercises aside from the actual shoulder joint itself we also take, want to take a look at what exactly are the arms doing so what you would want to do the arms ideally they should be pointing straight ahead if you were to have two pencils if they are internally rotated or medially rotated then that indicates excessive tightness in the medial rotators of the shoulder. If you were to take two laser pointers, ideally they should never meet. That would be perfect posture. The closer to you that those pointers would meet, the more medially rotated they are and the more problematic it's going to be. So you would wanna take a look at that and just take a, you can look at the actual hands for this one right over here. So just look, are they pointing toward the hip or are they pointing toward the backside? 
the more they are pointing toward the back, the more tightness there is in the medial rotators and the more soft tissue work you would want to do in the anterior aspect of the shoulder. But time is up, set number five. And while we are resting, we just have one thing left to assess for the postural assessment from the front view, and that is going to be the cervical spine and the head. With regard to the cervical spine and the head, you're looking at a few things. Number one, you want to take a look at the chin and the center of the nose, and it should be in line with the plumb line. The other thing that you want to take a look at is, is there any rotation going on with the head? So is it rotated clockwise, counterclockwise? Aside from rotation, the other thing that you would want to do is you would want to take a look at, is there any tilting going on? With regard to tilting, that is going to be a lateral flexion of the cervical spine. There could also be a shift. With a shift, the head is still can still remain vertical, but just the, it's, the chin is going to move off of the center line. So instead of having a lateral side bend, it's just a lateral shift. And you would want to make note, is it laterally tilted to one side or the other? Is it laterally shifted to one side or the other? Once you have completed all of that, that is it for the front view of the postural assessment. Next, you are going to move on to one of the sides. For the sides, I'm going to just pick one side for the purpose of this assessment and stick to that. When you are performing this on an actual patient, you would want to take a look at both sides because you would think that by looking at one side, it would be symmetrical on the other side. However, you can have quite a bit of difference between the right and left sides. So when you are performing this in real life on a real patient, you absolutely want to do the postural assessment on both sides, not just one. But from the side, I'm just gonna turn Johnny right over and that looks good right over there. We are starting once again from the ground up. And the first thing that you wanna do before you get your hands on the patient is just take a step out and you want to observe everything that's going on. With regard to the plumb line for this one right over here, the plumb line, you would want to place it in, at the lateral malleolus of the ankle. And you would wanna see is everything in alignment. So ideally, the lateral malleolus of the ankle, the lateral condyle of the femur, the greater trochanter of the femur, the glenohumeral joint, and the external auditory meatus should all be in one straight line. You would want to take note, is, are things being projected forward? Are things moving behind the plumb line? Because again, that, can all, that can all can indicate some type of pathology going on somewhere along the chain. Once you've done that, we're actually gonna start getting our hands on the actual patient and see what's going on from the ground up. So starting at the ground, we're going to just move on to the sixth and final set. And then once we get to the next exercise, you guys can join me again. And while we are resting, we are going to continue the postural assessment from the side. I already mentioned that you should check everything is in alignment from the external auditory meatus, the glenohumeral joint, the greater trochanter of the femur, the lateral condyle of the femur, and the lateral malleolus of the ankle. If you do not have a plumb line, you can put your fingers on the patient and just check joint by joint. So what you would do is just start from the ground up. You place one fingertip or your thumb on the lateral malleolus of the ankle and one at the lateral condyle of the femur and just see, are they stacked up? Then you would move up one more. So lateral condyle of the femur to the greater trochanter of the femur. Place your fingers on each and see, are they in line? Then you would go from the lateral, con la from the greater trochanter of the femur to the glenohumeral joint. Look, is everything stacked up? And then lastly, the glenohumeral joint with the external auditory meatus. And for this one, Johnny's actually pretty damn good. He's nice and straight. However, you would want to see, is everything, you know, is everything being projected a little bit more forward? Is it a little bit more backward? Then we want to take a look at what exactly is going on at the ankle. At the ankle, we are looking at, is it in a neutral position? Is it being plantar flexed or is it dorsiflexed? Plantar flexion is when you are going down towards, so imagine you're pushing the gas, that's plantar flexion. Dorsiflexion is your toes pointing up to the sky. So if the ankle is in dorsiflexion, then that means the lateral condyle of the femur is going to be projected anteriorly to the lateral malleolus of the ankle. So if you see this going on, that would indicate dorsiflexion in the ankle. If it is a plantar flexed ankle, it would be hyperextended. So what you would see is the lateral, uh, the lateral condyle of the femur is going to be projected posteriorly to the lateral malleolus of the ankle. And you would just make note of that. Then we would move up to the knee and we wanna see, is the knee in a neutral position? Is it flexed or is it hyperextended? So for this one, we could take a look, same thing at the actual knee joint itself. And ideally the femur, the tibia and fibula should be in one straight line. If you find that the tibia, it is slightly closed, that would indicate flexion of the knee joint. And if you find that the knee, that the tibia is a little bit more forward of the femur, then that would indicate some hyperextension in the knee joint. 
right? You would just make note of those. And we're just going to go ahead. We're going to rest for a couple of, we're going to go ahead and do the second set before we move up to the hip joint. And while we are resting, we are going to continue the side view postural assessment at the hip. At the hip, we want to take a look. It is, is it in a neutral position or is it flexed or extended? If the hip is flexed, then what that means is that the femur is going to be slightly forward. So it's going to be a little bit closed off in the front. If the hip is extended, then the femur is going to be extended backwards. So it's going to have a reverse C shape if you are looking at it from the right side. So from the front, if it's flexed, C. If it's extended, reverse C. Then we would take a look at the pelvis. The pelvis, we want to take a look at, is it in a neutral position? Is there antiversion or an anterior pelvic tilt? Or is there retroversion or a posterior pelvic tilt? With regard to this one right over here, there is a difference between men and women. For men, generally, you want to see anywhere from four to seven degrees of antiversion or an anterior pelvic tilt. For women, you want to see anywhere from seven to 11 degrees of antiversion or an anterior pelvic tilt. The way that you would assess that is you would want to place one finger on the PSIS or the posterior superior iliac spine, and then one finger on the ASIS or the anterior, anterior superior iliac spine. Then you would just get in front and you would want to take a look at the two fingers and you would want to see, is that greater than whatever the recommended amount is? So for men, if it is beyond seven degrees, that would indicate antiversion of the pelvis. And for women, if it is beyond 11 degrees, that would indicate antiversion of the pelvis. With regard to retroversion, for men, if it is below four degrees, that would indicate retroversion of the pelvis. And for women, if it is below seven degrees, that would indicate retroversion of the pelvis. Moving on from the pelvis, we're then going to take a look at the lumbar spine. With regard to the lumbar spine, we want to see the curvature and is it in a neutral position? Do they have excessive hyperlordosis or excessive hypolordosis? Lord, so the lumbar spine, it is a lordotic curve, it's extension. What you would want to see is anywhere from 20 to 40 degrees of curvature in the lumbar spine. If they have more than 40 degrees, that would indicate hyperlordosis. And if they have less than 20 degrees, that would indicate hypolordosis. Next, we would want to move up to the rib cage. But right now, we've got about 10 seconds left before we move on to set number three. So we're just going to let you do that before we start with the rest of the postural assessment from the side. And while you guys are resting, we are going to move up the spine to the lower thoracic spine. With regard to the thoracic spine, we're looking at the exact same thing as we did for the lumbar spine. We want to see, is it in a neutral position or is there excessive or limited curvature? With regard to the thoracic spine, we still want to see that 20 to 40 degrees of curve, but it should be evenly distributed. So you ideally, you would want to see 10 to 20 degrees in the upper thoracic spine, and then another 10 to 20 degrees in the lower thoracic spine. So for the lower thoracic spine, this is a kyphotic curve. That means it is a flexion curve. And what you would want to do is see, is it flat in the lower spine? So if it's flat, what's going to happen is typically they're going to just, it's just going to be straight from the rib cage down. And then if it's extended, you should see a gigantic curvature. Typically what's going to happen is a lot of people, they're going to have excessive hypolordosis, meaning a flat uh, curve in the thora lower thoracic spine, and then excessive hyperlordosis, excessive curvature in the upper thoracic spine. So for this one, the best way to do it, you would want to use some inclinometers. And for the inclinometers, if you have the equipment available, you would want to measure at the C7 T1 to get the angle at the top of the spine, and then at the T12 L1 to get the angle at the bottom. And then you would just add those two numbers together, and it should be between 20 to 40 degrees. So again, you would want to see 10 to 20 degrees in the lower thoracic and 10 to 20 in the upper thoracic. But when you are performing the static postural assessment, you could just take a look visually. And if somebody has severe hyperkyphosis, you're going to be able to see it without using any tools. The inclinometers are just going to be used to get a very specific reading. Once we've assessed the thoracic spine, we are then going to move up to the cervical spine. And we want to see, is it neutral? Is it hyperlordotic or is it hypolordotic? As with the lumbar spine, the cervical spine is a lordotic curve, meaning extension. So what you would want to see is take a look at the external auditory meatus, and you want to take a look at the glenohumeral joint. And ideally, they should either be in alignment with one another or within three centimeters. If it is beyond three centimeters, then that would indicate that they have excessive, the excessive curvature in the lower thoracic, in the lower cervical spine, and excessive forward head carriage. And in that case, you would want to perform some corrective exercises. 
And most people are going to have forward head carriage just because of the postures that we're always sitting in at the computer, driving on our phones and when we eat. So it's gonna be pretty common to see excessive forward head carriage, but time is up, set number four. And while we are resting, let's continue the side view postural assessment. We have one thing left before we switch, and that is going to be with regard to the head. Aside from just looking at the head carriage, we also want to take a look at any type of rotation going on at the cervical spine. So for this one, what you would do is take a look at the chin. The chin, if you find that it is toward the right of the manubrium, the manubrium being the, the bone at the top of the sternum, so if it's rotated over here, that would indicate some, clock, some clock, uh, clockwise rotation of the cervical spine. And if it is rotated to the left, so if the chin is situated to the left of the manubrium, then that would be counterclockwise rotation. Once we've assessed the head, that is it for the side view. Now we're going to move on to the back. With regard to the back, what we would do for this one right over here is as with the front view, if you're using a plumb line, you would want the plumb line behind the patient that way the patient cannot see it because if they can see it, then they can self-correct. But as with everything else, we would want to take a look as everything in alignment. So ideally the center of the skull, the spine and the hips should all be in one straight line. And as with the front, if you are using a plumb line, you would want it centered in between the feet. Starting at the ground up, it's a little bit redundant, but we're gonna do the same thing that we did with the front view for the feet and ankles. We wanna take a look first at the level of rotation. So. Are the feet externally rotated or medially rotated? If they're medially rotated, then you would be able to see the toes inside of the feet. If they are laterally rotated, then you would be able to see the toes from the outsides of the ankles. I already mentioned this, but if they are rotated laterally, that could indicate either tightness in the lateral hip rotators, or it could indicate tibial torsion. If the way that you would differentiate between the two is you would have the patient sit down and there's an assessment that I teach later on, but if they're sitting down, and the toes are pointing straight ahead, then that would indicate that the restriction is coming from the hips. If they are still laterally rotated, it could indicate tibial torsion, but as long as it is within 20 degrees, that's completely normal. The next thing that you would wanna do is take a look at supination and pronation. And for that, once again, you would take the business card. So you would place the business card at the lateral malleolus of the ankle, and ideally the lateral arch of the foot and the lateral malleolus of the ankle should be in one straight line. If there is a gap between the business card and the lateral malleolus of the ankle, that would indicate a flat foot or excessive pronation. And if there is a gap between the lateral arch and the business card, that would indicate excessive supination. But that is it for this part right over here. We have set number five, and then I'll join you back for the rest. And while we are resting, let's continue our postural assessment from the posterior view. We already took a look at the foot, uh, taking a look at the foot. Let's move up toward the knee. At the knee, what you would want to do is palpate the gastrocnemius first. So first, you would just want to see, is there any tension? Is there a difference between one side and the other? You could also place a fingertip at the Achilles tendon and just see, is one more tense than the other? Is there a lot more tension? Then we would move up to the popliteus. The popliteus is situated just behind the kneecap. So right between the femur and the tibia in that little space is going to be the popliteus. And then you would just want to see, is one more tense than the other? And you would also want to see, is are they even? Is one higher than the other? Is one elevated, depressed? From there, then we would move up the femur and we would want to take a look at the gluteal fold. So you would take your fingertips, you would place it right up at the level of the gluteal fold. And then you would want to see, is one elevated or is one depressed? And you would perform the exact same thing at the greater trochanter of the femur. So once we've taken a look at the gluteal fold, you would go one finger at each of the greater trochanters of the femur, and then you would want to go in front and just see, is one elevated or is one depressed? On Johnny, his right femur is a little bit higher, so that would indicate some type of hip pathology going on. Once we've assessed the, once we've assessed the actual femur, the next thing we would want to do is move up to the pelvis. With the pelvis, we are looking first at the lateral, uh, lateral portion of the ilium. So what you would do is you would want to place one fingertip on each side, see is it balanced, and then you would go to the PSIS. The PSIS is the posterior superior iliac spine, and it is these bones right over here. So you would take your fingertips, and the way you would do this is you would want to place it on the PSIS, then dig underneath it and lift up. That way you could get underneath the PSIS on both sides. And you would do the same thing. You would just stand right behind them, and you would take a look. Is it leveled or is one side more elevated? The next thing that we would want to do is move up to the lumbar spine and just do a little bit of palpation and see is one side more tense than the other. And you would want to take a look at the gap between the ilium and the rib cage. 
Ideally, they should be level. So what you would do is just place a fingertip at the rib cage and just see, are they level or not? Because if one side is shorter, that could indicate tightness in the lateral trunk flexors, such as the quadratus lumborum, which is gonna be tight in a lot of people and the reason that a lot of people have back pain. But that is it, time for the sixth and final set. And while we are resting, we are going to start moving up and continue on with the posterior view of the postural assessment. Well, now that we've assessed the pelvis and lumbar spine, we're just gonna go ahead and palpate the entire length of the spine upward. And we wanna take a look at the erector spinae group. So the iliocostalis longissimus and the spinalis and see, is there any difference in tension between the right and left sides? Once we've done that, we are going to move out to the scapula. With regard to the scapula, we're gonna be taking a look at a few things. Number one, we wanna take a look at, is it protracted or retracted? So with regard to protraction, you would want to take a look if they are moving away from the center line. If they are moving away from the spine, that would indicate protraction of the scapula. And you would also want to make note, is one more protracted than the other? So you could use the spine as your reference point and then just use fingertips to see where exactly, how far out the right scapula is and then how far out the left is. And make note, are they both protracted? Are they retracted? Is, it, is one neutral position and one in a protracted or retracted position? Once we've taken a look at the protraction and retraction, we also want to take a look at the level of tilt. So an anterior tilt would mean that the inferior angle of the scapula is moving away. And a posterior tilt, which is very rare, you're almost never gonna see this, would mean that the superior portion of the scapula is moving away from the rib cage. Next, we would want to take a look at the rotation. If the scapula is upwardly rotated, that means that the inferior angle is going to move away from the spine. So even if it is neutral at the top, it could be moving away, which if you are just palpating at the bottom of the spine and they have an upwardly rotated scapula, you may accidentally assess them as having a protracted scapula, when in fact, it could be a neutral with regards to protraction and retraction, but it can be upwardly rotated. So upwardly rotated, the scapula is moving away from the spine. Downwardly rotated, the inferior angle is moving toward the spine. Next, we would wanna take a look at winging of the scapula. Winging of the scapula would be the medial border moving away from the rib cage. So if, if you could get your fingers right underneath there, that would indicate some winging of the scapula. And then the last thing is we would wanna take a look at elevation and depression. So the scapula, ideally they should be in line with one another. You wanna take a look, is one higher or lower than the other? And then that would conclude the portion for the scapula. Next, we're gonna move up to the cervical spine, but time is up, set number five, the two. And continuing on with the posterior postural assessment, we are going to move up to the cervical spine. We're looking at a few things. First thing, we wanna take a look at, is there any type of deviation going on in the cervical spine? So is there any type of lateral flexion? Ideally, everything should be in one straight line. So if you find that it is tilted to the side, then that would indicate some tightness in the lateral flexors of the cervical spine. The other thing that we would wanna take a look at is at the skull, we wanna see, is there any type of rotation going on? To do that, we would take a look at the occipital protuberance, which is this right over here at the base of the occiput. Ideally, it should be in line with the spine. If they are, if it is rotated outward, then that would indicate some tightness in the cervical rotators. Next, we would take a look at the shoulders. So now we're gonna start moving distally outward. At the shoulders, as we did with the front, we would wanna take two fingers and place it at the, at the acromion, which is right over here. And you would just want to see, are they level? So you would just, Stand right over here, take a look, and you would want to see is one higher than the other, or are they even? Ideally, they should be even. Then we're going to start to move down toward the palms. With regard to the palms, we want to take a look at what the hands are doing. If they, uh, we want to take a look, is it laterally rotated, neutral, or medially rotated? In a neutral position, again, if they were to have two laser pointers, they should not meet ever. That would be perfect posture. The closer they meet toward the middle, the more medially rotated they are. So if you could see their palms and it is completely pointing backward, that would, uh, that would indicate excessive medial rotation of the humerus. And if they, are rotate, if they are pointing forward, that would indicate excessive lateral rotation. It's very, very rare that you will see lateral rotation of the humerus. Almost, most, almost nobody's ever gonna have that. I've only seen it in 20 years once. Aside from one patient that I've had, everybody has either had medially rotated or neutral humerus. But that is pretty much it for the postural assessment. Next, I'm gonna be taking you through some more assessments with regard to posture, but these are going to involve some of the tools that I mentioned earlier in the assessment video from a few days ago. But we're going to do that 
Right now, we've got about 20 seconds left before we've got set number three. If you guys have any questions so far with regard to any of the assessments from the, with regard to the postural assessment, drop them down in the comment section. Let me know what your questions are. And if you do have any patients that you have trouble with, let me know what exactly are they exhibiting. And if I can help you, I gladly will. But that is it. Time for set number three. And now that we have done the full postural assessment, we're going to start getting a little bit more hands on. And one thing that would be great for you guys to invest in would be some eyeliner because we're going to need to do some markings on the patient when we are doing the rest of the postural assessment. First thing we're going to do before we start marking them up is we are going to take two fingers, one on each side of the spine, and we just want to run it down. We're looking for a few things. We want to see if there's any imbalances. So is there more tension on one side than the other? And we want to see if there's any deviations. We want to see, let's say all of a sudden you go down and then you kind of do like a little mini C shape, reverse C shape or C shape, and then you go back down. That could indicate that one vertebra is out of alignment. However, if you find that when you're running the hands down the spine, a bunch of them are out of alignment, and then it comes back, then that could indicate scoliosis. With regard to scoliosis, there are several different types. With regard to the thoracic spine, thoracic scoliosis, we could have a C shaped curve which is going out to the left and then coming back down to the center line. We could have a reverse C, which comes out and then comes back in toward the center line. And then at the lumbar spine, we could do the same thing. If there is a lumbar scoliosis, a reverse C would be coming out to the left and back to the center. A, or sorry, that would be a C. A reverse C would be moving out to the right and coming back to the center. And then finally, we could also see a, an S-shaped scoliosis. So an S-shaped scoliosis, would be in the thoracic spine, everything comes out to the left, and then it starts to come toward the middle, and then in the lower thoracic and lumbar, it goes out to the right and back to the center. And then there's also the reverse S, which is the opposite. So in the upper thoracic spine, it's gonna start to deviate out to the right, it's gonna start to come down toward the center in the lower thoracic and lumbar spine, and then move toward the left, and then come back toward the center. Once we've done that, then we're gonna start marking up the patient. We're gonna do a few things. First, we want to take a look at the C7T1, and we want to mark the gap in between. In order to find that, you're going to place your middle finger where you suspect the C7 to be, and you are going to ask the patient to look up toward the sky. Once they look up, if the index finger moves inward, you know that you are on the right spot. If it doesn't move anywhere, you need to adjust. But you would grab your eyeliner, and then right in between the C7T1, you would mark it down. Next, we would move down to these, the T12L1. For the T12L1, you would have the patient do a side bend, and then you would palpate at the 12th rib, and then you would gradually just work toward the middle and end up marking that spot. But that is it. Time is up. Set number four. And while we are resting, we've got one final marking on the spine that we're going to have to make, and that is going to be at the L5S1. For the L5S1, what you would want to do is you would palpate at the posterior superior iliac spine, and then what you would do is just gradually move upward. As soon as you find a little bit of a divot, that is the L5S1, and then you would just place your marking. Then the last two on the posterior side with regard to the pelvis is you would want to measure at the PSIS. So for the PSIS, you would place your finger on the PSIS, you would dip underneath it, and then move the tissue up. As soon as you press up into it, right at the interior angle of the PSIS, that is you where you would place your marking. I forgot to mention this earlier, but with regard to scoliosis, there is functional scoliosis and structural. If it is a functional scoliosis, that means that the scoliosis is due to tight muscles and it can be corrected through corrective exercise. The way that you would assess for that is just have the patient bend forward. If they bend forward and the scoliosis goes away, you know it's functional. If it stays, you know it's structural and it's some type of skeletal deformity and you can't correct that with exercise. But Next thing we're going to do with regard to the, the back is we are going to place markings at the scapula. So for this one right over here, you are going to palpate. Once you find the scapula, you just want to do little lines so that you can kind of trace the scapula. And then that will come in handy later on when we are measuring the scapulospinal distance between the, between the spine. And then with regard to the markings on the front, we are also going to mark the ASIS or the anterior superior iliac spine. For this one right over here, you would just have the patient hike their pants down a little bit. You would place two fingertips on the anterior superior iliac spine or the ASIS. And then same thing, you would just, for this one right over here, because you, there's a lot of tension in the front of the hips, a lot of times it's gonna be very difficult to palpate it. So what you would do is you would have the patient hinge at the hips. As soon as they hinge, all of that musculature is gonna be put on slack and you'll be able to feel it a lot better. Once you feel it, then you get them to stand up. And then when they stand up, wherever your fingers are, you would place that marking. And that is the markings for the ASIS. 
Then for the actual measurements, the, the areas that we're gonna be measuring is the first rib angle, the forward head carriage, the pelvic tilt, and we want to measure the thoracic and lumbar curvatures. I'm gonna be showing you guys that during the next rest period, but right now time is up, set number five. And for the final portion of the postural assessment, we're gonna need a few tools, the ones that I mentioned earlier. The first one is going to be a check forward head caliper. And for this one right over here, if you have this available, this is great for measuring forward head carriage. What you would do is you would place this at the, at the sternal notch, which is the part right at the top of the manubrium. And then at the zygomatic arch, which is this bone right at the side of the face, you would want to line it up. For this one, you would ask the patient to close their eyes, that way they can't cheat. And then you would press. As soon as this white line goes away, you would take a look at the reading and see how, how much their head is projected forward. And ideally, it should be less than three centimeters. Then the next thing that we wanna do is take a look at the first rib angle. For that, I'm going to use a check inclinometer. For the, with the check inclinometer, the way that it would work is you would place one at the C7T1, where you ended up making your previous marking, and then one right at the manubrium. You would press inside, and then you would take your reading, and ideally, it should be approximately 25 degrees or plus or minus five degrees from there, but 25 degrees. The next thing that you would do is take a look at the pelvic tilt. For that, we would use the exact same thing. And for the pelvic tilt, you would get to eye level and you would wanna place one of these at the PSIS and then the other one at the ASIS and you would wanna see what exactly is the angle. So for men, again, four to seven, for women, seven to 11. And Johnny here, he is at, he's somewhere around 60. So he's got severe pelvic dysfunction. Once we've assessed the pelvis, the next thing we're going to do is take a look at the spine and we're gonna measure the spinal curvatures. For the spinal curvatures, we are going to use your basic inclinometers right over here and we're gonna need two of them. The first one, you would place at the C7T1 where you made your marking. The second one, you would place at the T12L1 where you made your other marking and you would wanna make sure these are zeroed out against the 90 degree surface. But when you get these two numbers, you would add up those two numbers together. And ideally it should be 20 to 40 degrees. And you wanna see it evenly distributed. So 10 to 20 at the upper thoracic, 10 to 20 at the lower thoracic. Beyond that, it is going to indicate hyper hyperkyphosis in the thoracic spine. And then for the lumbar spine, we are going to be doing the same thing. So we place one at the T12L1, one at the L5S1. We would take a look, add those two numbers together. And ideally they should be between 20 to 40 degrees. So if it is beyond 40, that would indicate excessive hyperlordosis. If it is less than 20, that would be hypolordosis. And that is pretty much the postural assessment onto the final set. Thanks for sticking around until the end of the video. Be sure to like, share, and leave a comment as it'll help the algorithm. And if you enjoyed the content, show your support by subscribing to the channel by clicking on the icon in the bottom right corner. And if you really want to show your support, then consider becoming a member by clicking on the icon in the bottom left corner. These new high quality videos aren't cheap to edit and the $5 membership will really help with the video editing budget. You'll also get access to a ton of exclusive perks like early access to videos and this program design lecture playlist in the top right hand corner. And if you want to learn how to do a one arm pull up, then check out the playlist on the top left corner.